Chancellor's Research Centre, ASRC, he hired Ray as his first member of the centre. And from that time on, Ray's boundless energy was poured into public education on weather and the environment. His popular radio weather commentaries, his articles, and his lecture series made him widely known as the voice of the ASRC. Uh, Ray started this series in the summer of 1962 in, in this, presumably in the lodge, right? Was it yeah. in the lodge? Wow. Um, and uh, 1973 expanded it to, the, to the, the Albany campus. So we also have a spring series. And if you can't get down there for the spring series, uh, you can also follow that online. Um, so this series is deeply rooted in ASRC's history and offers scientists a, a unique opportunity to engage with the public. Um, so that's, a, that's, that's about Ray. So what's, what's going on at ASRC these days? You know, we, as, as I just said, it, we were established in 1961. Uh, we have a total of 14 research faculty, uh, at least 20 graduate students, uh, 27 other researchers and 10 uh, administrative staff. And um, this is this slide, uh, don't sleep. <laughs> this uh, slide highlights the, uh, the, the research areas that we do. Um, so we work a lot in renewable energy. That's both in terms of wind energy and solar energy. Uh, resource assessment, obviously it's a, a very uh, uh, important area of research, including in New York, uh, with a lot of emphasis on uh, renewables. We study weather and climate. Uh, obviously, uh, regional climate modeling, numerical weather prediction, uh, cloud and aerosol processes, and a better understanding of the increased frequency of extreme weather that we've been seeing associated with drones. We work in the boundary layer, which is the lowest kilometer or so of the atmosphere, uh, to understand how that works. Uh, that's a picture of a drone. Uh, we actually collaborate with a company that does beyond line of sight drones, which is, scares me to death, uh, but they need weather information for that. Hopping down, we have a growing interest in urban uh, uh, weather and climate. We're doing a lot of work in understanding uh, human impacts, air quality, heat and flooding on human behavior, um, focusing on New York City in particular. We move across the left, we have air quality, atmospheric chemistry, and of course, that a, lot of, a lot of that takes place here um, uh, at Whiteface. And the, the final one on the left has a growing interest in exploiting uh, high performance computing to do artificial intelligence. Uh, applications which covers many things um, to do with weather and climate um, just to highlight quickly some of the core research facilities and of course white faces first uh, and of course i'm sure everyone's familiar with this with the silo where a lot of this research takes place here so that's something that we're very proud of at, at assc and um, we're actually planning to commemorate we just passed our 50th year of operations here and uh, we're planning to celebrate that uh, formally later in the year um, the New York State Mesonet uh, is a network of weather stations, which were, were again, uh, a resource that we're very familiar, familiar, very proud of. So every dot there represents a weather station, including one just out here, uh, the, the, uh, the base, uh, the base uh, location at uh, Whiteface. And so this is monitoring constantly weather information every five minutes, and the data goes to the Weather Service, it goes to the Department of Homeland Security, and uh, makes us safer. Uh, we also have a center of excellence where we're funded by the state to do applied research with uh, industry. So weather affects everything. I'm biased, I know, but weather affects a lot of fields, uh, be it health or transport. Uh, in this case, we're working with industry. Mostly we're working with utility companies uh, on their winter problems. They're very interested in knowing more about how winter weather can be better predicted or better understood in order to uh, keep the lights on. And uh, don't worry about this slide. It's just a highlight that we have probably the most powerful at the moment, high performance computing for artificial intelligence on the campus, if not in the States, uh, in, our, in our laboratory in the building. And finally, I just wanted to end up by celebrating, this is the building we moved into just, just, just under a year ago now. Uh, if you know Albany, it's off, not on the main campus, it's on the Harriman campus. But what I wanna, what I wanna highlight here is the various groups that are in this building, uh, AS, and, um, ASRC, DAS is the Department of Atmospheric and Environmental Science, another entity that does work, work in atmospheric science. We've got the Mesonet, Center of Excellence I just mentioned, and the Excite Laboratory, but also we have CEHC, which is a new college, uh, College of Emergency Management, Homeland Security, and Cybersecurity, so anything to do with disasters and decision-making. We have the National Weather Service in this building, um, Environmental Engineering, and Business Development, and all of that building, which is a huge building, if you ever go to Albany, uh, let me know and I'll give you a tour. 
Um, but uh, it's a very exciting place to be to, to push and do uh, interdisciplinary research to do with weather and climate. And that's uh, my introduction. Okay. And uh, afterwards, if you have questions, just let me know. So uh, let's go on to the main speaker for today. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Paul, oh, did you get that started? I have a loud enough voice, I think, where people will be able to hear me. And we'll give it to you. Come over here and view. Center view. Okay, Craig, can you verify that you can uh, see the slide? We're still on the intro slides, Mark. You're still on the intros. Okay, thank you. Yep, yeah, I think that's gonna be that. Let me do it again. Let's see. Oops. How about now? We're good now. Thanks, Mark. Okay. Thank you, Craig. Uh, so it's my honor to uh, introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, for our Zoom participants, uh, if you have questions that you would like to ask our speaker, please um, enter those into the Zoom uh, chat and Paul will address as many as he can at the end of the talk. And of course, our audience will, uh, will have questions available to them as well. So without further ado, Paul Jensen is adjunct faculty in the Department of Environmental Biology at the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry. And he works closely with staff from the Roosevelt Wildlife Station and Adirondack Ecological Center. Paul is also the Regional Wildlife Program Manager with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, Division of Fish and Wildlife, where he directs research, survey, and land management projects in the Adirondacks and Lake Champlain Basin. Previously, Paul was the fur bearer biologist for the region for 13 years, where his research focused on the ecology and management of American martins and fishers. Prior to joining DEC in 2003, he worked in Alaska where he was involved with long-term monitoring of caribou and waterfowl populations on the Arctic coastal plain and conducted research with the New York Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit at Cornell University. Paul received his BS in environmental and forest biology from SUNY Environmental Sciences and Forestry his master's degree in wildlife ecology from the University of New Hampshire, and a PhD in wildlife biology from McGill University. Please join me in welcoming Paul Jensen. Great, thank you, Mark. Does this volume sound? Oh, is that volume sound, sound, good. sound pretty good? Okay. Well, thank you everyone for coming tonight and thank you for all the Zoom participants. Um, I'm honored that I'm the first uh, in-person presentation post-COVID. I don't know if I can really say post-COVID. I'd like to say post-COVID, but uh, we're, in a, we're in a new reality, right? So anyway, it's great to be here. Uh, it's great to be with you tonight. Uh, this is actually the first time I'm really able to talk about the network in depth. I've given a lot of short talks, but nothing where I really kind of dove uh, deeper into the nuts and bolts of what we're doing. And it's really good timing also from the perspective that um, an article just came out in the Adirondack Explorer talking all about what, what we're doing. Anyone have a chance to see that or read that? Okay, a couple people. So if you hadn't had a chance yet, um, maybe pick up a copy of that. I don't know if you can get it without a subscription, but um, really good in-depth piece. So this, um, this project, um, the Adirondack Inventory and Monitoring or AIM, Camera Trap Network, is something that um, has been in my mind for many years. Um, as, a, as a new biologist, as a young biologist with New York State, um, the need for this type of work became quickly apparent to me. And then especially talking with other colleagues working around the Adirondack, saying, yeah, there's just a paucity 
of data on terrestrial mammals in this very large and remote region? And how can we sort of solve that, that problem? How can we fill that data gap? Um, so I'm really excited to, to talk more about that here tonight. So um, it's really all about collaboration, right? Um, the collaboration and forming partnerships with, with other groups and other, and other individuals to, um, to collect not only wildlife occurrence data, but also climate data or within a given year weather data. And hopefully over the long term, we're gonna be able to monitor changes in the climate within this Adirondack region and, and, and more specifically within Northern New York. So um, what, are the, what are some of the things I wanna talk about tonight? Well, sort of the history of the project and the need, why do we even need to do this work? Um, secondly, I'm gonna go over our goals and our guiding principles. What are we trying to accomplish and how? We're gonna talk quite a bit about our network infrastructure and um, I've been really, really fortunate to have a good friend and colleague um, by the name of Alex A. Seren. And Alex A. is at the University of Vermont, and he's working with the USGS Vermont Property Fish and Wildlife Research Unit there, uh, ter Dr. Terry Donovan and uh, Dr. Larry Clar Clarfeld. And they have, at UVM, have built a tremendous infrastructure to handle all the data that is generated from these types of surveys. Um, then I'll talk about our future plans, uh, what we hope to do over the next year, several years. And then um, we'll kind of just sort of take a breather, maybe stand up, stretch. Um, and then I want to spend the next you know, 15 minutes at the end of the presentation just going through some of the wildlife detections that we captured from our last field season. As I'll get into more detail in the talk, we had um, nine cameras up, six on white face, mountain and three in the Stevenson range, which is just kind of, I guess, directly to the north. And um, we captured a lot of really, really cool photos. So I'm hoping to sort of go through those. I have, I don't know, maybe at least 40 or 50 photos. So we'll go through them rather quickly, um, but I think you'll enjoy that, that very last segment and see what species live in your backyard. Um, but before I um, move on in the talk, I just wanted to thank um, several organizations that were absolutely critical for, for our network to begin. And in particular, I wanna thank the Eline Foundation. And back in 2020, um, myself and a colleague here in Lake Placid, Jill Walker, who is a teacher at Northwood School, and she's also leading the advanced STEM research program there. We approached uh, the Eline Foundation we pitched this idea to them. We really, we had no funding, we had no money, completely grassroots effort. And they believed in what we were trying to do. And it's all history from there. But a really generous gift from, from the Eline Foundation, as well as um, small grants from Toshiba, International Paper, Steward Shops, and the uh, Edward E. Ford Foundation. There was a matching grant that Jill captured with Eline, which really, um, is going to advance their STEM program there in Northwood. So just a little bit of history about camera trapping in New York. Um, and I'm actually gonna back up from that a little bit and talk about what were some of the methods that we used before we were using these camera traps or you know, scientists will call them camera traps. Most, most lay people, most, you know, whatever, we'll just call them trail cameras, right? Um, but the first thing that we started using um, in New York actually were, were track plates, really low tech, but a really good method of detecting um, small mammals and in particular small carnivores. And that's really what I was interested in. As, as a young biologist, um, I, ha I had the responsibility of managing a suite of about 17 species, but I was really honed in, really focused on um, American martens and fishers. And these techniques have been developed out in the Western US and again, they're really quite simple. Um, you can see that that purple cubby, a triangular cubby there, which does anybody recognize what that is from? I actually repurposed it from another survey. Anyone? Emerald ash borer, right? All got it. Emerald ash borer surveys that the department was doing. 
and um, they were done with them. And so they gave me, you know, piles and piles of that chloroplast. Funny side story is, is that they're using a pheromone sort of dissolved in this really sticky substance. And so I had one of my interns work on heating that sticky stuff up and scraping it off. And of course it was loaded with insects and her hands were just filthy. So I felt bad, but well, that was a good, I then hired her on as a technician. So she proved herself uh, in that regard. But anyway, um, what you see in there, it's hard, a little bit hard to see, but there's a, the black flooring is actually, a, is, um, it's a lum, aluminum, a piece of aluminum that's covered with carbon soot. And so you take an acetylene torch and you monkey with the settings. And so it's really billowing out the smoke and it covers that aluminum plate with this soot, with this carbon soot. And then you take shelving paper um, and you put it so it's sticky side up. So you peel it off, you put it sticky side up. That's the white piece that you see on the bottom of that cubby. And then you put a piece of bait in the back. And what happens is that these animals like a Martin or a Fisher, um, maybe a fox size animal would then walk over that carbon soot and that carbon soot would transfer to its feet, to its foot pads. And then from there, it would go onto the, onto the contact paper and register a positive track impression on that white paper, which you see on the right. And those are Martin tracks. Now we also modified that to include hair snares. And so we're looking at using the hair snares to collect um, genetic samples that we can then uh, determine individuals. And if you can determine individuals, you can estimate um, population abundance from that. So that worked great, low tech. It's still, people still use that today. But um, in the early 2000s, um, the camera technology started to, to increase. And I would say that some of the better uh, camera traps started coming on the market probably in the late 1990s, early 2000s. However, they were, they were really expensive. You know, some, some of them were upwards of uh, $500. Some of the cheaper models were about 200. And one of the limitations is that you had to use uh, rolls of film, right? So 24 or 36 exposures. So you really couldn't get a lot of data on, on one roll of film. But we started that work about 2006. And some people had done some previous surveys uh, for carnivores um, prior to that. But we started in earnest about 2006. And the methods that we used are much different than we're using now. Um, we used um, bait and we would do three week surveys and we were really targeting, again, these carnivore species that would come in, attracted to the bait, attracted to some of the lures that we we're using to draw them in. And so we were very, very quick surveys and we moved all around the Adirondacks. Very, very effective. As you can see here, we detected coyotes, uh, fishers, martens, um, really a lot of different species, including some species you wouldn't expect, like deer and moose that were maybe just curious coming into the, to the scent. Um, but we were able to collect a lot of data, and it wasn't really until recently that we started thinking beyond just the suite of carnivores to really looking at multiple wildlife species. Now, the, the map on the left is probably familiar to a lot of you. It's a, a map of the Adirondacks, and it shows you the public lands in green, the forest preserved lands, and then the conservation easements in yellow. And of course, as many of you know, uh, the public lands um, comprise of almost half of the park, so about 3 million acres. And then conservation easements are probably around 800,000 to 900,000 acres. So significant acreage in the Adirondacks is protected, um, but it's a very large and it's a very remote landscape. And so it's very difficult to um, comprehensively conduct wildlife surveys for a lot of these species. So these camera traps really um, are a, a great technique to do that. But what we realized, um, again, early on as a biologist, and especially a biologist working for New York State, um, I would work on teams that would compile data for these different land units in the Adirondacks. For example, the High Peaks Wilderness Complex. And we would write unit management plans um, and part of my job as a biologist was to compile all the avail available biological data on a given unit. And what I, what I quickly realized that, okay, we've got really good data sets for birds, like the breeding bird atlas. We've got some decent data sets on amphibians and reptiles through um, the herb atlas that was done for about 10 years to the department. 
Um, and we have some records from um, hunters and trappers on where they harvested specific animals. But by and large, the data set for mammals was very, very sparse. And so for many, many years, I'm thinking, how can we, how can we fill that, that, that data gap? Um, and really this has been um, sort of a work in progress since then, as we've looked at what are some methods that we can use to collect data over large scales and over long temporal periods. So the framework um, that we're working at under with our uh, camera trap network is um, we have several goals. One is inventory. So we're, we're looking at, again, multiple species, not just the carnivores, but really any of the terrestrial mammals that occur here in the Adirondacks. And so just, just gaining a better idea of what species are where um, is, is one of the most basic questions that you can ask in ecology. And a lot of other questions, uh, more complex questions, derive from those, from those simpler questions of, of distribu distribution uh, and abundance. The other thing that we're hoping to do and planning to do is monitor these species over time. We're, we're also very interested as wildlife scientists, we're also very interested in climate change and how climate change is going to impact the distribution and abundance of these species. And so we're looking um, not only at saying, okay, we're, we're really interested in detecting any wildlife species, but we're also honing in on a smaller suite of species that, are, that will be most sensitive to climate change. Species like the American Martin and Bobcat and fisher and moose and snowshoe hare. Um, the other thing that we're interested in monitoring are species that are currently being managed or monitored by other state agencies, like the New York State DEC or state parks. Um, and we're also interested in how wildlife are using linkages in uh, New York State and beyond. And I'll show you some of that work here in a minute. Um, another goal is to share data. This is not about us collecting data as a group of individuals and just hoarding it and saying, these are our data, or we're gonna use them and no one else is gonna use them. We're explicitly getting that data out there, we're archiving it, we're making it available to other, others in the scientific community um, to do research, but also the more maybe pragmatic uses in terms of land management, again, for UMPs, looking at where these species are, how are they changing um, and how can we better uh, influence our management as an agency to make sure that we're uh, promoting the sustainable use of, of these species. And then lastly, um, one of the things that makes our network very unique is an, is an educational and training component. And so we're working um, with students from high schools all the way up to graduate level students and providing opportunities for them to do real world science, to get training, uh, we're working with, um, in particular, a lot of the teachers in the region and their students. And it's really, it's been really exciting to kind of hear the feedback from the teachers. That first, one of that first slides I showed you with the moose on it, that was from a teacher in Northville. And she was so excited. She just, she just got that image maybe about a month ago. And she said the students and all the teachers in the school were just ecstatic. And they couldn't believe that there's moose down in this area. This is, a, I think I mentioned it was in Northville, which is in Southern Adirondacks. And even the, the entire community of Northville was very excited to learn that they had moose in their town. And uh, so it's really, it, it's not only about doing the real world science, but it's, it's also about engaging people, right? It's about engaging students. And um, what a great opportunity for them to learn about the species in their own backyard. But at the same time, realize that, hey, we're not just doing a classroom exercise, we're actually contributing to science and people are going to use these data to answer questions. And I think for them and for the teachers, you know, that, that was, uh, you know, that was the clincher as far as the teachers getting on board and getting their students on board. So there's been a lot of excitement and energy um, on that front. Um, our guiding principles are that obviously with, with surveys, you have to make sure that they're standardized. And so I had mentioned my colleague, um, Alex A. Seren at University of Vermont. I'll talk a little bit more about the protocol he developed. But I was really, in a lot of ways, I was very fortunate because I had this idea of developing a network of individuals and organizations to actually implement the work. But I didn't necessarily have 
the protocols and the methods ironed out on how to do it. And that's where Alexei had spent um, six years uh, of his life working on his PhD, developing this protocol. And so it was a great sort of marriage between the idea of a network and a very, very fully developed and vetted protocol coming together. Um, other guiding principles, flexibility. So we do have, while we do have standardization, there's minor tweaks that we can make, make you know, keeping it simple. Um, and part of that is um, having lots of resources that people can use as far as training and understanding how to implement these surveys. Um, opportunities for students, um, maintaining really strong partnerships and ability to scale up. We want something that um, is not just suitable for uh, small scale study areas, but really could be implemented statewide, region wide, even continental wide um, if needed. And so we definitely have some of those ideas in the back of our mind. And, and even since the beginning of the project, we have scaled up and continue to scale up. As I mentioned, um, Alex A had developed the protocol and I took that protocol and, and fleshed it out a little bit more. Um, that's this document that you see on the right. And one of the things I quickly learned is that a very detailed protocol is, is necessary for people to follow and to understand what they're doing and really have sort of step-by-step -step instructions. Um, and that's been great. And people do refer to that. But what I've also found is that what people really want are a very visual um, instructions through videos and other things, other hands-on training workshops where they can understand the methods and then they don't have to, you know, spend an hour of their time reading a 30 page protocol, um, which I always tell people, if you look through that protocol, you know, you're going to be a little bit intimidated because it's so detailed, but it has to be that way. But then when you, when you see the video and you actually see how these camera trap stations are set up, it's like, oh, wow, this is actually really, really simple. So it's been an eye opener for a lot of our partners. Um, so the basics of the protocol, I know this is a little bit hard to see. Again, this was based upon six years of field research at um, uh, excuse me, the University of Massachusetts is where Alex A uh, did his PhD, but he did his field work in Vermont and New Hampshire and also parts of Maine. And again, he was looking at what can I use to um, detect multiple species. He was really interested in American Martin, Canada lynx, and snowshoe hare. That was really sort of the, the primary um, species that he was focused in on. But he, he realized, oh, I'm, I'm detecting all these other species as well. And so um, it's a multi-species detection protocol. But in a lot, of, a lot of camera trap studies, what people will do is they'll put the cameras up but they don't have really any ability to collect weather data. And so Alexei's protocol was unique from that perspective in that he incorporated a snow stake that could measure snow depth. So whenever he was getting a detection of uh, any wildlife species, he was also getting a measurement of the snow. Um, and also one of the things that I added to it was, a, was an eye button, which collects temperature data. And so what you see here, is the snow stake in that middle photo. Um, you'll see there's a, there's a feather on the side. So that's a visual attractant. So a lot of species are just drawn in from motion, something moving around, and especially the carnivores. Um, and I'd say even very specifically, bobcats are very drawn to visual movement. Um, and he, he, of course, was interested in Canada lynx. So the same thing, cats are very, very interested in movement. Um, and then on the far right, you see the snow stick again, and you see that little elbow, that PVC, that's where the I button sits up inside of that. So it's like we have this mini weather station um, that's sitting there. Um, it's got the feather as, an olf as a uh, visual attractant. And then we have an olfactory attractant, which I think is probably pretty hard to pick up on this photo, but it's, I'll just point it out here. It's kind of like right here. And you might see just a slight yellow color. And what that is, it's a vial, it's a plastic vial. And it has skunk lure that um, has been placed in uh, Vaseline. So I melt down the Vaseline and then we put the skunk lure in the Vaseline. 
we swirl it around, we let it re-solidify um, in these small vials, and then we put these small vials out on that snow stake. And so you may be asking the question, why skunk? I can't really answer that question fully. All I know is that a lot of different species are attracted to it, which, you know, as a human, you might think that's, that's really odd, right? That's really odd. But actually, fresh skunk blower smells like a, like a fresh cut onion. Um, so you have to take my word for it. But um, there's a lot of different species. In some ways, it makes sense that the carnivores are um, attracted to it. But um, it does really attract a lot of different species. It brings in animals, not from super long distances, but, but far enough where if they're moving through a corridor or through a riparian area and they pick up that scent, they're going to come in and investigate it. Um, contrasting this to using bait, like I showed you before with our carnivore surveys, this is a much easier protocol because with the bait, you have to go out, you have to, first you have to obtain the bait and then you have to, you know, process it, put it into smaller segments, haul it out to the field, put it in, um, you know, wire it to a tree. And then you have to check it frequently during the three week survey to make sure that the animals haven't depleted it. This is a much, um, much easier um, protocol because you, you put the scent up, you can literally put these camera stations up and let them run uh, for very long periods of time. I'm going to show you some photos today of the surveys that we did here where we set the cameras up um, in mid-October and we didn't check them until the end of June. And the SD cards are, are large enough now where they can hold 10, 15, 20,000 images depending upon the, the resolution of the, of the photos. And the lithium battery uh, technology is, is just fantastic. And so we're going out. Um, we, may, we may collect you know, 500 photos at a given site and the batteries are still at 100% over that length of, of time. So really um, great method for um, setting up, you know, the, the, the survey stations in remote areas and just letting them run and coming back and checking them, you know, months uh, later. Um, what else do I want to say about the protocol? So we use, um, we, we establish sample units. I'm going to show you here a tool that we use to do that. The sample units are, um, I took a hexagon grid and laid it across the landscape. And they're each hexagon grid, it's like a fishnet. And each hexagon grid is four square kilometers. And so our protocol is that we place one camera within one sample unit or one camera for every four square kilometers. Um, and we use a variety of different model types. Again, I talked about the lure, snow stakes about three to five meters from the camera. And for the most part, uh, we are sampling between September and May, although we're kind of on, on both ends of that. And what um, Alex A found with this protocol is that there's a very high probability of detection for most of the species that we're looking at. And I'll show you a table here in a second. And again, I, I had mentioned the survey checks. Um, some, like especially the, the students in high school, they want to go out frequently. They want to know like what did we get uh, on these cameras on campus. And so they, many times they want to go out like once a month and pull out the SD card and see what they've, see that they've got. But we're also putting these cameras in some very, very remote areas um, in the high peaks and in other places that you, it's just very, very difficult to get back to some of these areas in the winter. And so we're putting them up in the fall and then just letting them run. And that's exactly what I did here um, at Whiteface in the Stevenson range. So you don't have to check them at all. You can let them run for the entire survey period. Yeah. Does the animal trigger the camera or are you taking pictures of the camera? No, so the question was, do our animals triggering the camera? Yep, there, there's an infrared sensor. Um, it's detecting um, the difference in heat between the ambient temperature and the animal's body temperature. And so that's what's triggering the camera. Um, and the cameras have very, they're very, very quick. They, they turn on very quickly and you can program them to uh, take multiple photos <clears throat> within a very short period of time. You can also program these cameras to um, take photos at regular intervals. And that's been important for monitoring snow depth because if you're reliant on just an animal triggering the camera, you might miss several days of snow depth data um, so you can do both. 
um, you know, you can detect the animals, but you can also just set it on a regular timer. So that was a protocol we're using. And I, I had mentioned that um, very high probability detection. And all that is really is that conditional on an animal being present within an area of the landscape, what's your probability that you're going to detect that animal, detect it, meaning you're going to get a photo of it within a certain period of time. And what Alexei found was that depending upon the survey duration, which you see on the top, that's 10, 20, and 30 weeks, that the probability of detecting most of these species approached 95% over 30 weeks. So um, you can see also that a lot of the species that are our focal species that we're really most interested in, like moose, snowshoe hare, bobcat, fisher, and martin, have very high probability of detection over 30 weeks and even fairly decent probability of detection over 20 weeks. So that was good news in that, um, again, expanding our view beyond simply carnivores and looking at the whole assemblage of, of wildlife species and the wildlife community, um, we wanted something that could detect, you know, anything from a red squirrel to a moose. Um, and so it's been, it's been a really great protocol to use. And if you're interested in reading it, it's actually, you can, you can look at it online. Um, it's a pretty heavy document. And uh, Alex has published, I don't know, half a dozen or so papers from his dissertation work. So it's been very, very successful. Now, um, we've been talking a lot about our network within the Adirondacks, um, but we also are a part of this bigger network that I've mentioned, this Northeast Wildlife Monitoring Network. And that's the work that's being conducted at Vermont. And as you'll see, um, as I get into some of the nuts and bolts of the network, that the Northeast Wildlife Monitoring Network includes the states of Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Massachusetts. And the partners that are working within that network are mostly wildlife agencies. They're state and federal wildlife agencies like Maine, uh, Inland Fisheries and Wildlife and New Hampshire Fish and Game, but also federal agencies like the USDA Forest Service, at White Mountain National Forest, the Green Mountain National Forest, um, some of the refuges in Vermont and New Hampshire um, with the uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service. And so they're pretty much using professional uh, biologists as part of their network, as well as Dartmouth College. And AIM is a, AIM is a piece of that. We're, we're working in Northern New York State and contributing data to this larger landscape. But as you'll see, we're taking a little bit different approach. We're, we're less heavy on professional biologists and a little bit heavier on using, using students um, to get out there. And again, it's because we have that explicit objective of using that for education and training. So we'll get into a little bit with the, with the infrastructure. Um, if you look at, um, again, partnerships really are the most important thing of what we do. Yes, the protocol was great and to, to latch onto that, have some really solid methods but ultimately you need boots on the ground to, get, to do this work. Um, and, it's, and it's not easy. It's, a lot of it is you know, hiking in steep and rugged terrain. It's going places where there are no trails. Um, it's getting back there in winter and having uh, you know, snowshoes in deep snow. Um, so we're using what I'm calling a targeted citizen science approach. What you'll find that, so probably one of the, most well-known camera trap networks in the United States is called Snapshot Wisconsin. And Snapshot Wisconsin pretty much used a shotgun approach. They just said, if, if you wanna go and do these surveys, let us know, we'll send you a camera and we'll tell you where to put it. Um, and it's been very, very successful and they've generated just oodles and oodles of data. That's more of a sort of a general approach is to put it out there, see who, who wants to participate. We use more of a targeted citizen science approach where we identify individuals from um, not so much agencies, although we are working with agencies, more from universities and field stations, again, tapping into students, uh, faculty and teachers, but also working with NGOs like the Nature Conservancy, like the Wildlife Conservation Society, um, Adirondack Mountain Club, um, and then lastly, working with high schools, both public and private. 
And this is just where I want to give um, Jill Walker a plug. Again, she's a teacher at Northwood and directs the advanced STEM research program there. And we have this, this sort of side project that we call the Aim High Collaborative. And so Jill coordinates all of the high school teachers from around the region um, and sets up the training, gets the equipment for them. And she's been really successful with, with writing and receiving those grants that I had mentioned previously. So if you look at our project area, the first thing, which is that yellow boundary, first thing you might say is, well, that's not just the Adirondacks and you'd be correct. Um, but Adirondack Park is the centerpiece of our study area. And so that's why we're calling it the Adirondack Inventory and Monitoring Project. But really it also includes the St. Lawrence Valley, the Tug Hill, parts of the Mohawk Valley, and also parts of the Lake Champlain Basin. So it's a very large region. It's about 40,000 square kilometers. Um, and as you can see from those, uh, those markers on that map, we have a fairly decent coverage across this region with our various partners. And you can just take a moment. I know that, again, that's probably pretty hard to read unless you're up close, but the yellow markers are universities. The, uh, the teal color, blue colors are biological field stations. And then the reds are high schools. And um, we have quite a few people. We have about 50 partners right now that are involved with the AIM network. And um, we certainly have areas that we want to expand into. And I'll talk about that sort of at the end of my, of my presentation. But we're working as far south as, as Siena College. I have a professor there, uh, Dan Bogan, who's interested in doing some work kind of a little bit outside of our area, the Rensselaer Plateau. Um, of course, uh, SUNY ESF is involved. And then we have a number of, of high schools spread all the way from um, Poland Central School and Northville Central School all the way up to Saranac Central School up at the very top of the state. We're working with a lot of really good biological field stations. I would be remiss in not mentioning um, the field station here at Whiteface Mountain. And Paul has been a great partner with me, not only on this project, but also with a lot of my Martin and Fisher research. Um, but we have other field stations like the Adirondack Ecological Center, uh, Cranberry Lake Biological Station, the uh, uh, ESF uh, Ranger School. So really, we, we, we sort of cast a wide net, but again, it was very much targeted in terms of who we were asking to be a part of this, of this work. One of the cool things that kind of just happened organically, I didn't plan for this, is that um, if you look at the Adirondacks, um, and if you and if you spent any time here, you know that it's not just wild land, is it? It's not just wilderness areas. Now there are some world class wilderness areas here, but there's also a lot of private land, and there's hamlets, and there's villages, and there's small cities that are interwoven right among these public lands. And so we were working with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation to get permission to survey the public lands, but we really weren't covering the private lands very well. So um, that's where the students that are involved with this work at various high schools, they have really filled this niche to be working in the hamlets and the villages and the towns of Adirondack Park, really surveying areas that we otherwise wouldn't be surveying. We're covering again, the forest preserve lands. And so that they kind of have a, a little bit of a niche, right? But then there's, a, there's the NGO like ADK that's working with me. And again, I targeted sort of working with that group because I knew they had this group of what are called summit stewards. And these summit stewards hike up these high peaks almost daily to educate hikers about fragile alpine ecosystems and making sure that they're protected, people stay on the trail. And so I was able to work very closely with Kayla White at ADK. Um, she coordinates that summit steward program. And these summit stewards, uh, like you see here in this photo, are probably covering some of the hardest terrain that we have. And as you can see, there's, there, you, know, you need young legs to, uh, to be able to go back into some of this country and set this equipment up and you're, you know, you're carrying snow stakes and you posts and the cameras and everything else. So it was just neat how that sort of happened organically is that we have people that kind of depending upon um, where they live and what they're doing 
are helping to survey very different areas of Adirondack Park. We're also interested in these landscape linkages um, and the Nature Conservancy is working, um, spearheading this effort called Staying Connected Initiative, of which I'm a part of. And so they're really interested in looking at how we can identify and promote and maintain these landscape linkages <clears throat> between areas, uh, heavily forested areas and areas that facilitate wildlife movements, not only terrestrial mammals, but also aquatic um, animals as well. So for example, you see those red arrows. Uh, these are some of the landscape linkages that they're, they're heavily invested in. And we're really planning to use these data um, to inform all of that work. So linkages like the Tug Hill to Adirondacks, the Adirondacks to the Catskills, Adirondacks to the Green Mountains, and even through another organization, um, Algonquin to Adirondack Initiative, uh, looking at this linkage between Adirondack Park and Algonquin Park in Ontario, Canada. Um, so what we do, again, under this guiding principle of we want to make this as easy and as simple as we possibly can for our partners. Otherwise, people are just won't do it because right? you're asking them to do work for you, um, albeit very cool work. But what we're doing is we're, we're writing grants, we're receiving funding to build up an inventory of equipment and then provide that to, <clears throat> to the teachers, to the NGOs, um, and in even some cases to the universities for them to use with their students and faculty to go out and do these surveys, <clears throat> excuse me. And so um, we're using these grant funds to purchase things like camera traps and the Python lock, that's that cable you see there, um, the, the stake, the snow stake, the U-post, the attractants, really everything that we need to do this survey. Um, and it's about $225 per station which really is, you know, when you look at it, the cost of the data, that's actually pretty cheap when you consider a station that is monitoring an area year round or most of the year and can collect tens of thousands of images of, of a variety of different wildlife species. Just for kicks, I just threw in that old, that's an old camera there. That's, um, I think a deer camp. When we first started, that was, that was a $200 camera um, and, you know, you can see there's a little Olympus camera uh, at the very top of that. And you can only get 24 or 36 exposures from a single, you know, use. But um, now, nowadays, it's like $200. You can buy a really good sort of mid-grade camera, even cheaper than that, $150, $170. And again, with these SD cards, you can collect tens of thousands of images. So the, the technology has just been uh, seen crazy growth. Um, this is what I was talking to you about. This is an online tool that we develop. And what this does is it allows our partners to go to this site and determine what would be the most efficient area of the landscape for me to sample. And so without really going too much into the weeds on the sampling design, uh, what I will say is again, this is, this is allow, allows flexibility because if you're a teacher um, and you're working in a given town, you may want to do three sample units that are relatively close together because you know it's going to be really difficult for me to get students on a bus and move them around and get them to a site. And so they can cluster sites and clustering sites is actually a good thing. We, we encourage that. But what they can do is they can go in, um, they can zoom in, and I'll show you that in here in a minute. They can zoom in, they can determine what is, what is the label for that specific grid cell or hexagon cell sample unit on the ground. And then they, they, go to, <clears throat> they go to this page and they create labels for the snow stake. And you'll see that in a lot of these photos where the snow stake has an ID on it. And that ID on the snow stake corresponds to that sample unit on the ground. But again, this is really useful for people that are doing this work to be able to sort of define where they're going to be working. And our network is still small enough where the partners kind of communicate with one another and say, okay, hey, we're going to do these four or five sample units. Is anyone else covering this area? No, okay, this is where we're going to, this is where we're going to work. The other thing that um, has been really handy are these um, tools for field data collection. And we're using 
um, an app called Survey123. It's put out by ESHRI, ArcGIS. And what this allows uh, one to do is when they're deploying cameras <clears throat> is using you know, a tablet or their smartphone, they can go out, they can click on this app and you can see this is the Northeast Wildlife Monitoring Network app. You see up here, upper left-hand corner. Um, <clears throat> and you can, there's a lot of different surveys that are already published that you can use. This one was developed again by um, the Vermont Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit. <clears throat> so then you just hit the collect button, excuse me. Um, and then you go through a, just a series of screens. And what you see here, the first is what's the project ID? <clears throat> and that, those are just different partners. So you can see, <clears throat> excuse me, you can see the different partners. And again, we're using this all across the Northeast. So AIM is being one partner in the Northeast network. Our projects were right there at the top, but then all those partners or projects below that are different organizations like Dartmouth, Green Mountain National Forest, uh, Green Mountain National Forest, and so on, that will then select that. Say, so this is who I'm working for. Um, you can also um, identify yourself. You identify the visit type. So am I putting, am I putting up a camera for the first time? Again, this is after you're putting up a camera, you're putting up the snow stake and saying, okay, yeah, I'm setting this new camera. I'm here on a certain date. A lot of these are auto-populating. There's the time, what's the location ID. It's got a built-in GPS unit. So you can get GPS coordinates right off of the app. Mark? Well, we have an online question. Is, it, um, is this website publicly available? Is there a public access part of this or is this only for collectors? This, um, this app has not, is not publicly available. It's only for people that are involved in, in the network because the problem with, with releasing it to the public is that we're, people, people could use it and then those data would be erroneous and then just going into the database. And so it would be a lot of error checking and saying, okay, yeah, these are, these are not, these data shouldn't be here. Um, so, but it's a really, really handy, um, app and very, very um, user friendly. Um, we track equipment, you can track the camera status. Um, and it, it also allows, like, you know, I think you probably saw back here, this is also used for when you're going back in and you're checking the camera. So that might be like in my case with the, with the white face cameras, it was several months before I came back to check them. That's okay. I would hit, I hit, um, I'm checking the camera now. And um, what that does. Is when you is when you hit check, um, and you record how many images. So your your camera is going to say, uh, this camera has collected 655 images. I would put that number in that box, and what that does eventually is it gives you. If you look at the bottom of the screen, there a bunch of numbers, and what you do is you label your SD card with that string of numbers and then bring that back to your computer. And then at the very end of the survey, you're, you're going to hit submit, that check button at the very bottom, you hit that, it submits the data. If you're in cells coverage, it automatically will upload your data. If you're not, it will wait until you are in cell coverage and then you can upload it. But in either case, what you'll do is you, you hit that submit button, you now have your SD card that's labeled with that number. And then it uses this power automate function where you're going to get, you're going to receive an email that says, based upon our records, you collected an SD card with this number, and then it's going to give you a link. And when you click that link, it brings you to a Microsoft Teams webpage. And from there, you simply transfer your images to the appropriate folder. And I'll explain a little bit more about the data pipeline next. But that kind of gives you an idea of how someone who is out setting a camera, collecting the site information, or checking a camera, looking to see, okay, how many detections did we get, and taking the data back to the field, how we get it from the SD card, from the field, to an archive system, right, where we can actually use the data. So this is just... I've talked a little bit about this, but our data management pipeline really 
involves three components, collection of the data, processing the data, and then archiving and sharing the data. So the collection is kind of what I just talked about. You're out in the field, you have cameras, you're, you're either deploying them, putting them up for the first time, in which case there's no, you have no images at that point, right? But maybe you come back a month later, maybe you come back nine months later, you check it, again, you go through this process. Um, so you're checking the camera, the, you're labeling the SD card, you upload the data. I talked about the, at the very top line, all the way to the right, that power automate function sends an email that prompts the user to transfer the images from that SD card to a cloud storage site on MS Teams, Microsoft Teams. The processing part, then those images get transfer, transferred to, again, that MS Teams site. What we're working on our artificial intelligence filters, I say we, the folks at UVM, are working on filters that can be applied to these images to remove any images where there's no, no detections of wildlife in them, just blank images. And you get a lot of those in, in actuality. And so as much as you know, maybe 60% of your images might just be blank, no, no animals in them. The other thing we want to do is create um, a function where the artificial intelligence can identify that it's a human that it's in that photo. And if they can, and if you can see their face, that it fuzzes the face out. And the reason for that is that we have um, we have students, we have minors that are working on this project, and we want to protect their identity. We don't want that just going out um, to the internet. That's in progress. Um, they just recently developed a beta version of the image tagging. So this is where you know all these images, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of images. I think we're the last I checked, we're over fifty thousand images for this year alone across the Northeast. Um, you have a lot of different partners that can then go in and look at these images and manually tag them and say, this is a fisher, this is a marten, this is a moose, this is a deer, um, the snow depth is 60 centimeters or it's 80 centimeters. Um, and so we're using that human element to do some of the initial tagging, but then what we're, what we're going to do eventually, we're pretty close to doing this, is automated species identification using artificial intelligence. So humans will train these models, computer models, to understand what's the difference between a marten and a fisher, or a moose and a white-tailed deer, or a gray fox and a coyote. And by us training these models, then we can automate this process where then the computer can go through and classify thousands and thousands and thousands of images very, very quickly. And that really, you know, I talked about this change in technology between the old film rolls and using these digital cameras that we have now, which is, it's been great. But the, the downside of it is that we have massive, massive quantities of data that we have to deal with. And these images that we have to look at every single one is extremely time consuming. Um, we collected in some of the projects we've done where we had 200 cameras operating for say three years or so, we generated um, in excess of a quarter million uh, images that we had to go through. So for long-term monitoring, a project that we hope is going to be going on in, in perpetuity, uh, we have to develop a very, very efficient data pipeline. <clears throat> once, once this middle processing um, part is done, then it goes into this archiving and sharing, and we're using an archive um, that's, um, that's owned and maintained by the federal government, the, the USGS, um, called ScienceBase. And all the data will be archived there. Um, and with that, we, there's, there's regularly scheduled data releases. So I think every three years, we will publish a data set and um, release that to the scientific community. Um, and then the, once they have permission to download those data, and that um, the scientists can go in and download data for a particular region or a particular time period. And then from that, develop research and, and management products. Um, and just really briefly, we're right now we are actively involved with two research projects. Um, even though the, the AIM network is relatively new, we only started in 2020, we're, we're contributing to the New York Mammal Survey Project, which is a statewide um, effort to 
get a better understanding of uh, the mammal community at the statewide level, but in particular, the very, very small mammals. Um, and so we're not really picking those up with the camera, but we are getting some, some data on some of their high priority species like weasels and, uh, and flying squirrels. We're also working with the USGS uh, New York Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit at Cornell University. They have a, a moose study right now in the Northern Adirondacks. They're employing um, our protocol on that study, uh, looking at getting a better understanding of uh, abundance of moose in, in Northern New York. And so we're, um, we're kind of tag teaming with them and we're covering a much broader area. They're covering a very specific area um, in that Northern region. And we're pooling, we'll be pooling our data together to get a better picture of moose across uh, the entire region. Questions. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Um, then just real quick, we're we're really active with training. This is one of one of uh, three training workshops that we had last summer at Northwood School, where we take out groups of teachers. We do very similar trainings with um, university faculty and and staff. Had a training with Paul Smith uh, Paul Smith's college students um, and some others. And so we'll take people out and actually show them hands-on, how do you set these stations up? And, and again, they're always amazed that, wow, the protocol seems so complicated. And when, when you actually do it, it's so easy. Once you get familiar with the, with the methods, if you were by yourself, you could set up a station in about a half an hour. And if you have two people with you, it's you know, closer to 20 minutes. Um, I won't play it, but this is just a video that I did. You can see the camera trap in the, in the background. We find that video tutorials are very, very useful. And um, uh, we've had a, a, a number of them on deploying camera traps, checking camera traps, demobilizing camera traps, programming I buttons, using survey one, two, three, using MS Teams. Those video tutorials have been very, very helpful. Communication, um, we use a program called Slack. It's a really useful platform allows our partners to communicate and share photos and ideas and if, if folks have issues they can you know they can work together to you know find solutions um, this is that Microsoft teams page I told you about it's very very similar but also incorporated with this MS teams again is that ability to upload data from the cameras to uh, to the cloud storage uh, we're, we're also on Twitter right now. That's our primary means of communication about the project, although we're, we're in the process of developing a website. <clears throat> so stay tuned for that. And then we also have a Twitter account for the uh, Northeast Wildlife Monitoring Network. And we post lots of, of really cool photos there. Um, and then lastly, coordination. We have a coordinating committee. Um, just real quickly, great group of individuals. Um, I'm the, the PI on the project, the project coordinator. We also have Jackie, Dr. Jackie Frere at ESF, um, who's a co-PI, and Stacy McNulty at the SUNY Adirondack Ecological Center in Newcomb, who's a co-PI. Co I mentioned Jill Walker, and then uh, Vanessa Rojas is our data manager. She's working with a lot of our, our uh, tech applications like the Survey123 um, app that I mentioned. And then a science advisor, we have Alex A. Seren, who I, who I mentioned, and our technical advisor, Rachel Bakirian, who also works for uh, DDC. And we meet a couple of times a year and uh, discuss issues in the future. So this is, uh, again, very quickly, this is from last year. This is from last year's field season. Um, across the Northeast, we're on target to deploying anywhere from 500 to 600 cameras. Um, we're not actively deploying cameras right now in the Adirondacks, but they're still deploying cameras in places like Massachusetts, which you can see is kind of, there's a hole there, but um, we deployed approximately 175 cameras in the Adirondacks this past season. And then again, the remainder were in those other states. Um, real quickly on the horizon, uh, what do we hope to do in the future? We wanna increase network coverage in key areas of Northern New York. As you probably saw from that map I showed you, the Western Adirondacks, the Tug Hill, uh, the St. Lawrence Valley are places that we really need to sort of pull more partners in. Uh, we want to expand this, um, our network from Northern New York to all of New York State. And at that point, 
um, that would become more of within the umbrella of the Northeast Wildlife Monitoring Network. Um, we want to refine our sampling design and I'm really strongly considering co-locating co our camera trap stations, at least some of them um, at snow survey locations and also the mesonet sites, which Chris had mentioned um, here. So again, not, not trying to compete at a site and certainly not you know, staying far enough away where it doesn't compromise uh, data collection, but, but pairing those together so we can get value added data. Uh, we want to develop new partnerships and develop additional training resources and teaching modules and hire a part-time network coordinator. All of these things I mentioned are going to uh, necessitate that we identify and secure additional grants and other funds in order for the network to be sustainable in the long term. So we're actively looking for grants and funding um, to continue our work. Um, and now I just have a bunch of slides that just quickly go through. Um, this, these are from our 2020 season. So these are some moose from the Shingle Shanty uh, Preserve and Field Station, which is um, a very remote field station uh, outside of Long Lake. And you can see that snow stake there. Of course, this is in the spring. See that feather at the top. And our partner, Steve Langdon, that works at the station, got like over 30 photos of these moose. A lot of them were, they were actually checking out the, the skunk lure. Um, here's, a, here's a mama bear with three cubs. You can just see the, that third one way in the back behind that down log. That was cool. This is from um, Vanessa Rojas at uh, SUNY ESF Ranger School. Lots of bears in that area of the Adirondacks, Cranberry Lake area. Coyote, this is outside of Lake Placid. This is one of the high school students captured this image. Uh, decent sized coyote in early winter. Um, this was in um, the Southern High Peaks region, a nice white-tailed deer buck. Uh, anyone know what that is? It's a Martin. We've got quite a few Martin. Again, these are all uh, photos from 2020. And now I just quickly want to show you some photos from our work this past year. Um, this is looking at, that's Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, Esther there. And then in the background, so this is kind of white faces to my rear. And then just beyond Esther is, you can see the, the beginning of the Stevenson range. So we work kind of this whole area. Um, and then on the backside, going up this drainage um, back in the Stevenson range. So I want to share with you, this is something we do at every site. We, this says, this says white face, but this is actually the Stevenson range. And um, again, we started in mid-October. That number you see on the side, that's that sample unit number that I showed you on that grid, that tool. And that sample unit number is also on the snow stake. So you'll see that. So this is all, all these photos right here from the Stevenson range, lots of bears, bears everywhere. Here's, and they're really in no particular order. I didn't do it by season. I just threw a bunch of photos together. Uh, white-tailed deer, buck in velvet, cool photo. Lots of, lots of deer, lots of bears. Um, if you see in any of these photos, if you, if you see the snow stake leaning to one side, it's because a bear pushed it over. And you can see, um, kind of make out the, 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 the sample unit label at the very top of that snow stake. He's a, he's a good, he's well-fed bear. Yeah. There's a red fox. See in the background, we detected both red fox and gray fox. This was a really, um, this is one of the blondest fishers I've ever seen. And we've trapped, you know, we just finished up a project. We trapped over 180 fishers in the Adirondacks and fitted them with GPS collars. And I don't think I've ever seen a fisher so blonde as this one. I could see a lot of people confusing that and thinking that was a Martin. Probably a female fisher. Um, coyote and Stevenson range. Moose, this was, this was mama moose coming in and then here's her yearling uh, behind her. So this, is, so this is May. So this would be, the, this would be about the time when they, when they drop their calves. So we know obviously that that one behind her is not a calf, it's a yearling. Um, and they hung out and I probably got about at least 15 different photos of those two moose. And another coyote, 
snowshoe hare fairly ubiquitous in this region more so the higher in elevation that you get on white face we picked up a lot of a lot of snowshoe hare what's that oh no that's a fisher a lot of the fishers a lot of the fishers will do that you can see one of the one of the ways some people have a hard time distinguishing martin and fisher if you look at a fisher one of the things that really helps me in, in addition to their size difference with fishers being a lot larger than martins is the shape of their tail and if you'll notice on a fisher the tail is a lot longer proportionally to its body to its body length but also it goes from a, sort of a wide at the base to a it tapers down at the tip and can contrast that with a martin Martin from the base to the tip is about the same diameter. And so that's been a really handy uh, tool to use. But again, Martins are a lot smaller. Another Fisher, another Bear, Spike Buck. We, we got probably at least, I don't know, I wanna say eight, eight or nine different bucks on camera between the, between the Stevenson range and Whiteface. Um, and then going to uh, Whiteface here, uh, there's a fissure there at the base of that tree, some nice foliage. Um, this, is, this is where, you know, some of these, it's not always clear cut. And this is why I, I put this image here. Even folks that are in this work and have done this for years, we have a community of folks that will say, hey, what is this? Is this, is this a coyote or is this a gray fox? It's not always easy. And uh, that is most likely a, I would say, a gray fox, but, you know, I, that's one I would pass around and say, hey, what do you think? Again, this, now this is on white face, um, snowshoe hairs just about everywhere. And this is really very, very close to where we were at here. And Paul, maybe you know where that is with that, with that black pipe, but we just got the nose of that moose. You may be wondering, why is this snow stake like that? Well, it's because of bear. Did that? Yeah. That's where what I was talking about. Yep. Okay. Yep. So we detected the Fisher, Martin, Moose at that site. Another mama bear with two cubs, and our one and only bobcat. So this bobcat came in, hung around the area, probably attracted to that site by that by that feather moving. But yeah, that was that was really cool to detect that bobcat. Um, this was at um, almost uh, well, it was about 4,300 feet, so about 500 feet from the peak of Whiteface. A lot of Martin. That site we had our most, uh, the greatest number of Martin detections. A lot of snowshoe hair, very deep snow, obviously, and that's where we started picking up red squirrels. We didn't really pick up red squirrels ever, anywhere else. And again, some close up of a Martin poking around by the front of the camera trap. And then this was our one site. I was really disappointed. And this, this happens is this was a site near the top of Esther. And this bear came in in, uh, in, the, in the fall, uh, in November, and just pretty much trashed the site, knocked the snow stake down, and then pretty much didn't, didn't attract anything else. Just got the, the lure and everything just got buried with snow. And so we, we had maybe about 40 pictures or so, most of this bear trashing our, our station. Um, so with that, um, there's my contact information. If you want to reach out to me, I'm happy to stay as long as uh, people have questions. But, uh, and there's our, our Twitter handles for both uh, the AIM Camera Trap Network and uh, the Northeastern Wildlife Monitoring Network. <laughs>